All righty, let's um, get back to Borges here. Um, I was interested in reading your, your quizzes and seeing what examples of textualization fables you gave. And a couple of you referred to a passage in the Aleph. Who, was, who, was, who among you referred to that, your face that can be seen? Oh, goody. Would you tell me your name? I'm sorry, I didn't give you. <coughs> Blake, oh gosh, Blake, how have I not figured you out? Here, would you mind, <laughs> thank you for doing that. I, I love that, that, come and get your paper, because I don't, yeah, here you are, perfect. Would you, when you get back to your microphone, would you mind telling us what you saw there? Who was the other person? There was another, maybe that person isn't here. I, I loved your careful reading of the Aleph. You may or may not have your text in front of you, but remind us where that face pops up and how, will you? Um, when he's looking into the Aleph, and he's describing all the things he's seeing, like everything in the universe, um, it kind of stands out because he says your face or you, or I don't yeah. exactly remember. But. Yeah, does anyone have your Aleph text? Elizabeth, I see you looking at it. Do, does anybody locate that easily, that particular moment? That is such a smart reading. Thank you so much. I, and to the other person, whoever you are, there were two of you who noticed this. That is one of those <laughs> rupturing of the picture plane moments in Borges. Sorry? 28. Amy, you just read us the, the phrase or two, will you? He's in the midst of his great list of things, that synecdocal list, synecdoche. I said the thing that, you know, the part that stands for the whole. We get all these parts and we're meant to understand it as everything. And one of the things he mentions is, tell us, Amy. I saw my own face and my own bowels. I saw your face and I felt dizzy and wept, for my eyes had seen that secret and conjectured object whose name is common to all men, but which no man has looked upon, the unimaginable universe. Yes, thank you. Yeah, and the your face, you know, if we weren't in thinking in terms of trompe l'oeil and textualization fables, we might think, well, he's referring to um, Beatrice Viterbo, the woman whose funeral he, or, you know, this, he mentions Beatrice and her, her hands and so forth. Um, but I think the your there is very calculated. Blake, do you want to add anything to that? Um. Not really. Good. Okay, well, thank you for noticing that. There, was, there were two of you who noticed another textualization fable, and Nishant is one of them. It, was in, it is in Plone, Ukbar, and Orbis Tertius, and that's a very hard story that we need to think about in a more continuous fashion. But just giving, <coughs> given our interest in this textualization idea, this way in which this is a particular magical realist device is what it is, Borges uses it all the time. Nishant, tell us, and you'll remember from Clonuk Bar and or Orbis Tertius where it happens, but just give us a little rundown, would you, Nishant? You have to push, push the button there on that microphone. Put it close to you, why don't you? Yeah. Um, the only part I remember where it actually happened was the last page where he starts talking about all the stuff that's invading his world and he just ignores it. And uh, do with it, but it just reminded me of popular culture invading, uh, like, traditional language and stuff like that. Yeah, that's interesting. Now that's an interesting thing. I mean, we all live in layered realities, don't we? I mean, we speak a certain, certain kind of academic language in class and so forth, and then we go out and we listen to rap music or whatever we do that isn't, or go to any movie practically. Yeah, so, so that's kind of interesting, the, the, the invasion of one set of linguistic markers by another. But doesn't it start out, Nishant, even I mean, doesn't the, the story start in a way like that? That it begins as someone reading, the narrator reading a Encyclopedia Britannica entry about this world. And then in a way, he's not he, literally brought into that world, but that world invades his world in the end and takes over. Let's look at the last page there. This playing with layers of reality is something that we're going to see endlessly, and I've, maybe you're tired of it already, but let's, Chloe Nukbar and Orbis Tertius is a very hard story, but you have to stick with it, and it is internally coherent. He's describing a world where there are no nouns in the language. Now, what does that mean? If you have no nouns, you have no objects. 
There are no objects in this ideal world, only ideas. He is a kind of parody of idealism, of the Plato's notion that there's a world up above our world where there's an ideal chair, which is more real than any of these chairs around here. It's a Platon he's playing with a philosophical notion of idealism and taking it to its illogical extreme. But let's look, Nishant, where do we start here at the end? At the top of page 18, is that where you would have us go? Uh, yeah. Yeah, because you're so right. The, the, the ideal world invades the real, and finally the narrator doesn't know which is which. And it's a world that is, he's right about. Let's look at the last two paragraphs. The contact and the habit of Plön have disintegrated this world, this real world, right? Enchanted by its rigor, humanity forgets over and again that it is a rigor of chess masters, not of angels. Already the schools have been invaded by the conjectural, quote, primitive language of Plön. Already the teaching of its harmonious history filled with moving episodes has wiped out the one which governed in my childhood. It's like the Martians have invaded and are uh, taking over. Already a fictitious past occupies in our memories the place of another, a past of which we know nothing with certainty, not even that it is false. Numismatology, pharmacology, and archaeology have been reformed. What's numismatology? It's a, numis, a numismatist is a coin collector. So the study of ancient coins, I take it, it's the only time I've ever seen an ology, usually speak of numismatics, or, and a numismatist is a coin collector. So it's typical of Borges to find this recondite, erudite, arcane little reference but he does it. Pharmacology and archaeology we know. I understand that biology and mathematics also await their avatars. A scattered dynasty of solitary men has changed the face of the world. Their task continues. If our forecasts are not in error, a hundred years from now someone will discover the hundred volumes of the second encyclopedia of Plon. Then English and French and mere Spanish will disappear from the globe. The world will be Plon this ideal world of ideas where there are no nouns. I pay no attention to all this and go on revising in the days still, in the still days at the Andro Adroge Hotel, an uncertain Cavadian translation which I do not intend to publish of Brown's urn burial. Two re references, Quevedo and Brown are Baroque writers. So he continues in his, in his hotel room to write something he does not intend to publish a translation of, of a, bro, a, a Baroque translation of a Baroque writer. So um, again, that Borgesian shrug at the end of the story. Well, he says, that's the way it is, folks. I'm just waiting here. I'm waiting it out. Yeah, Anne? Is, is that kind of a common thing? I mean, I'm finding it to be so, and someone can show me differently, but you mean the Borgesian shrug at the end? <sighs> yeah, absolutely. The, there's, there's not. I mean, yeah. there's a big moment of realization, but there's not a big movement to do anything about no. it. No, I think I've said that that's a very typical move. Remember at the end of the Library of Babel, the same mm -hmm. thing. I'm enlivened by this elegant hope. What that somebody will come along and find a disorder which repeats itself, and therefore is a certain kind of order. Um, it's just so big. Yeah. And then, mm -hmm. and that's the Borges yeah. and Shrug then? He just that, kinda, that Borges, oh well. Borges is most interested of all in the ways that human beings try to explain our existence. And there's so many explanatory structures. Think of world religions, think of our myth, the myths, think of the myth of education in our country, for example where we all need a college degree. I mean, we do, and I love education, and I think it's the only form of, real form of liberation. But there aren't, every culture doesn't feel that way. Now, we might feel they should feel that way because we're right and they're wrong. But the fact is, there are lots of rights and lots of wrongs. And so Borges makes fun of systematizing. He says, there's a, there's a story where, which we'll see, and he says, it's Pascal's fear. He says, 
um, the fact that we cannot explain the world doesn't stop us from trying. And so, so that Borgesian shrug, you, I wouldn't want you to read Borges as a writer of despair. What I want you to think about him as is a writer who speculates on speculation who wonders how we know what we know, wonders what we know. It's both the epistemological and the ontological question in his, in his work. Um, and then what he does is postulate finally, almost, I guess, always, I would say, that you can't know. Remember the circular, ru uh, the circular ruins, which is one of the most, I think, accessible of his stories. Once you understand that there's layered dreamers and dreams there, you could say that the fellow at the end, the magician, does finally know that he's been dreamt by another. There's a certain kind of self-knowledge there. But what kind of self-knowledge? To learn that you're a figment of someone else's imagination. But why, why don't we think we are? Maybe we are. What he wants us to do is step back a step and say, who created me? And it's not really cultural critique so much as metaphysical and philosophical critique. How do I know what I know? How do I know what reality is? And so all of these devices are in there to make me wonder. So thank you for, for saying that. I, I think you're absolutely right that this is, this is a character, Borges will never say, you know, they're never going to be a big grand coda and a big tonic chord at the end that's a dum dum at the end. It's always going to be, mm, you know, it's, there's always a kind of um, uncertainty, which is what he cultivates. We can be sure, and often what he does and we'll see it in Pascal's sphere in a minute, he gives us lots and lots and lots and lots of examples of the same image barely revised to show, as he says, that the, the world is a handful of metaphors. The history of the world is a handful of metaphors, meaning we repeat and repeat our efforts at understanding from culture to culture, from generation to century to millennium. So it's, it's speculative work, and I, I like that about Borges. And he asks some of the, I think, big questions of, he precedes postmodern thinking, I think. Remember, this is 1944. It's postmodern as a period and term is really com becomes current in the 80s. And what are those questions? How do we tell a story? What's the difference between history and, and novels? What's, what kind of narratives can we? count on. And postmodernism says none. If we receive them, they're master narratives. They're telling us how gender should be and how nation should be. And look at all of the mistakes we've made. So there's a great deal of uh, postmodern, postmodernity and postmodern theorizers tend to ideologize the same questions that Borges is asking in a rather more philosophical sphere. If that helps. <laughs> Let's just, since we're here at Clon, anything else you want to tell us about this, Nishant? Other ideas that we might find useful? Uh, honestly, most of it was just a bore. I actually had to skip a couple pages just because yeah. I was so tired of it. Yeah. Yeah, I told you you might have to throw this, this story across the room about a couple of times, but you made it to the end, Nishant. That's good. Um, what Borges is doing in the story is having a great time describing, taking an idea and making it real within the story. To invent a place that is a total ideal realm, where there are no things, only ideas, is, a, is, a, is a, a, an interesting uh, enterprise. Let's put it this way. Yeah, Ruth? What I was going to say is that um, I like how Borges makes all of his all of the, these stories seem circular in the sense that in every one of them he mentions another, you know, like the numismatology, yeah. like the Zaire. Yeah. Well, you know? thank you very much. I hadn't I hadn't even thought of that. Of course, that's a great idea. And it makes yeah. him seem sort of his stories almost seem yeah. infinite and yeah. like they all are connected. Yeah. yeah. His his own work is labyrinthine in the right. sense that yeah. and and he loves that notion. Uh, if he could write a garden of forking paths, he would. What he can only all he can do is describe it. If he could write the Aleph, he would. All he can do is describe it, you see. But that, that's so, so interesting. And it goes exactly to his idea that all the, the, the history of literature, the history of the world, is a, it can, be, it can be considered as a handful of metaphors. Right. And for, as we know what his are. We, the labyrinth, the dream, the garden of forking paths, the Aleph, the, the library of Babel, all of those monumental, infinite, eternal structures that can never be ever held in your hand or described on the printed page. So it's thank you for, very much for pointing that numismatology out. I should have thought of that because the coin is important. What, what I want to do is leave you to your own devices a bit with this story because we don't need to go into all of this 
minute description of this abstract world, which is uh, really Tlan is the literary world of Ukbar, remember? So it's, all, it's another world removed even from the real world that we think we enter at the beginning of the story. But go to the postscript. I want to propose to you that these are flies on the text <laughs> of um, that there are two objects here that intrude from outside in the same way that our trompe l'oeil artists have put flies on the surface of the painting to remind us that's just a painting or put a nail or a little a little um, label. Remember the backs of those paintings we saw? The, the paintings of the backs of paintings where there are little pieces of paper tacked on to suggest two different realms, or the curtains that we saw that are drawn that are supposed to be in our world, whereas the painting itself is both the painting behind the painted curtains is supposed to be uh, a painted world. It's hard to describe, easier to show. But look at page 14, the postscript. Um, what happens in this? Do you remember the main thing of this postscript? Something happens. It's that two things, suddenly these two worlds, the real world and clone, the world, the ideal world of clone, two objects intrude into, two clonian objects intrude into the world of the narrator. Look at page 16. He's playing here absolutely with the fly device, the nail, the cartolino, those little pieces of paper as they're called. In 1942, events became more intense. Are you all there, 16? I recall one of the first of these with particular clarity, and it seems that I perceived then something of its premonitory character. I won't define these words. You'll, you'll know them, because you will have looked them up. It happened in an apartment on La Prida Street, La Prida Street, which exists, by the way, and it's the street where Shul Solar lived and where his museum is to this day. So it's a kind of nice little nod to his friend, Shul Solar, if you want my opinion. Facing a high and light balcony which looked out toward the sunset. Princess, and then this, you have to think, remember that Borges is hysterically funny. He's pulling our leg. He, he, now this, suddenly this Princess Faucigny Lusange had received her silverware from Poitiers. From the vast depths of the box embe embellished with foreign stamps, delicate immobile, delicate immobile objects emerged. Silver from Utrecht and Paris covered with hard heraldic fauna and a samovar. Coffee maker, right? Russian. Amongst them, with the perceptible and tenuous tremor of a sleeping bird, a compass vibrated mysteriously. The princess did not recognize it. Its blue needle longed for magnetic north. Its metal case was concave in shape. The letters around its edge corresponded to one of the alphabets of Tlun. This was the first intrusion of this fantastic world into the world of reality. I am troubled by a stroke of chance which made me the witness of the second intrusion as well. It happened some months later at a country store owned by a Brazilian in Cuchilla Negra. Amorim and I were returning from Santana. The river Tacuarembó had flooded and we were obliged to sample and endure the proprietor's rudimentary hospitality. Go down about an inch on your page by daybreak the man was dead in the hallway. The roughness of his voice had deceived us. He was only a youth. In his delirium, a few coins had fallen from his belt, along with a cone of bright metal the size of a die. Die is singular for dice, right? The size of a dice. <laughs> in, in vain, a boy tried to pick up this cone. This is the world that has no objects, and now we're going to see this cone that is so heavy that it impress, makes an imprint on the palm of the narrator's hand. A man was scarcely able to raise it from the ground. I held it in my hand for a few minutes. I remember that its weight was intolerable and that after it was removed, the feeling of oppressiveness remained. I also remember the exact circle it pressed into my palm. This sensation of a very small and at the same time extremely heavy object produced a disagreeable impression of repugnance and fear. One of the local men suggested we throw it into the swollen river. Amorim acquired it for a few pesos. No one knew anything about the dead man except that he came from the border. These small, very heavy cone cones made from a metal which is not of this world are images of, divi of the divinity in certain regions of Tlone. Here, it's, it's like nonsense. What is this man talking about? You know, but it, 
so we're supposed to laugh in a way. He's making fun of a sort of this ideal world where two things, the other that a compass comes into the world when there's no real space in Plurn either is also funny, contradictory. Yeah, Chris? It seems like he's really breaking on the sci-fi territory. Like yeah, he has yeah. this childish fantasy about things and he just, he refuses for them to not exist. Yeah. You know? Well, there is, there is something like that. He reports, of course, as if it were purely factual. But this is, this is fantastic literature, really, isn't it? How could he know that this is a symbol for the divinity in certain regions of Tlern? If, if it were a realistic story, he'd, the, the narrator couldn't make such an assertion. Or you'd have to say, I read someplace that it said that, you see. Well, that's true. You're right. You're right. He does have a certain expertise in this area. Thank you. You're right. You're right. Yeah, he doesn't have to cite his sources here. I think you're right. <laughs> Nonetheless, I, I guess I'm going to go, well, with both of you. See, that's, that's perfect. You, the two of you have just made the magical real moment happen because there's enough reality in the text that we're supposed to believe him. He studied up. At the same time that if we look at it, we said, this is nonsense. It's like a childish, fantastical. But we're supposed to be, we have to take it both ways. So thank you. Those are both very useful commentaries. Um, we don't need to keep reading too much more, but just let's go down a bit. Also, Ruth here, notice that tremulous bird. We've seen that tremulous bird before in the circular ruins. And let's see, there's something else that well, of course, the, the heaviness of the coin in the Zaire. We really should go to that story next, shouldn't we? It says, here I bring the personal part of my narrative to a close. The rest is in the memory, if not the hopes or fears, of all of my readers. Let it suffice for me to recall or mention the following facts. And then he goes ahead, and we don't have time for it. There is... A, Go up one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight lines from the bottom of this same page, and then we're, we will have uh, almost arrived at the last two paragraphs, or we will arrive at them. He, it's rare that with Borges you get a reference to, say, something like Nazism or anti-Semitism. The, 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 Exception is the Garden of Forking Paths, but usually we're in another world. We're in the Library of Babel. We're in a basement in some place, obviously in Buenos Aires, but not necessarily a place that we identify with political and cultural realities. He's a writer of ideas more, I think, than a writer of cultural difference. We're going to, Carpentier is the opposite, and so is Garcia Marquez in a way. So um, Carpentier is much more, in fact, culturally polemical even than Garcia Marquez. He wants Latin American understood Latin American reality understood in magical realist terms and he wants us to know that symbiosis is a good thing and mestizai. Here these issues don't come up very much. But at the bottom of the page 17, they do. He says, the true, 10 years ago, any symmetry with a semblance of order, dialectical materialism, anti-Semitism, Nazism, was sufficient to entrance the minds of men. This story is actually written, the postscript is dated 1947. He puts it into the future. It was written in 1946, this story, if I'm not mistaken. Or it was before 47, 46, I believe. But what is, he's, you know, he's commenting on World War II here. Now, that's, that's something we, we need to notice. That's real. This Clonian stuff is one thing. He says, 10 years ago, people really got into terrible, terrible ideological trouble. Nazism, anti-Semitism, dialectical materialism, by which he means Marxism, was sufficient to, entran to entrance the minds of men. How could one do other than submit to Tlon to them? Why now won't we flee to a world, another order, another time and place? This <coughs> irony about our endless attempts to understand and systematize the world. How could one do other than submit to Tlön to the, to the minute and vast evidence of an orderly planet? It is useless to answer that reality is also orderly. Perhaps it is, but in accordance with divine laws, I translate in human laws, which we never quite grasp. Echo, 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 library of Babel, library of Babel, that order that we never quite grasp. So of course we're going to go to Tlön, this orderly, unreal, ideal world. Tlon is surely a labyrinth, but it is a labyrinth devised by men, a labyrinth des destined to be deciphered by men. And then those last two paragraphs that we've already read, where he seems to have a slight regret, this narrator, that the Tlonian 
uh, regime is being imposed upon the world, uh, he says, of course, we'll choose this alternative to the disorder of reality. So he's, he's again playing with this ideal and real plane, if you want. Let's do go to the Zaire where we have other comments or questions, any comments, questions about all of this, please, anybody? Did you kind of make your way through this story, most of you? The Klön, I keep saying Klön, Klön, that umlaut, as you know, if you speak German, Chris does, gives, I don't, but I know that the umlaut over the O makes it a Klön instead of a Klön, 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 it would be in, in Spanish. I actually once heard a brilliant paper on the reason for those two dots over the U, a man who asserted that everything is meaningful in Borges and why there would be that umlaut. I can't remember what he said. I have his essay, though, and I'm going to tell you on Tuesday if you can wait that long. Uh, okay, let's go to the Zaire. We can uh, get through a couple of these rather quickly. Who's got the page for the Zaire handy? 156, thank you. Okay, um, Ruth, since you were mentioning the Zaire, would you mind telling us just a quick summary of this plot? Um, it's about this man who, um, after the wake of um, the mm -hmm. um, he's in a bar and this coin of the Zaire mm -hmm. is worth, uh, worth 20 centavos comes to him. And um, it, it causes him to always think of that coin. Mm -hmm. And um, he then reads this Barlock's book, and um, which reveals to him that desire in Arabic means notorious or visible. It is one of the 99 names of God. The people of Muslim territories say it's unforgettable, and it drives one mad. And Borges kind of realizes his own fate. Uh huh. Okay. Sorry. And then he shrugs. And then he shrugs. Yes. Yes. Uh huh. Yeah. Um, this is about, I mean, now, careful not to read this too psychologically, because, again, I want to say that this isn't psychological fiction. If we really had to say something about the inner life of these characters, it would be hard to do, wouldn't it? But I, I like to read this in opposition not to Tlön, Ukbar, and Orbis Tertius, but to Funus the Mem Memorius, because, Ruth, what happens in Funus the Memorius? Isn't it kind of the mirror image of what's happening here? Yeah. Tell us that. Tell us what happens in Funus, um, the Memorias. Well, the Funus boy is, is paralyzed um, when, and he begins seeing things in rich, rich mm -hmm. detail. Yeah. And it causes him not to think because he's just so full of yeah. perception. Right. He can't generalize. He can only specify. Yeah. The opposite of generalize is to specify. He, if, he ha if he remembers something, he remembers all the times he remembered it. So in a way... Yeah, Heather, were you going to say something back there? No. Um, so if if you had to do the opposition to the Zaire, how would you do it? Or let me answer my own question. I, that's a loaded question because I, I have a reading that I have in mind. But isn't it the case that, that the Zaire is a fellow is obsessed by something, one single thing? He's obsessed by a singular reality, whereas so he's a kind of, let's say, generalist who can't specify, whereas Funus is a specifier who can't generalize. Yeah. So, so it, it, that's not quite clear enough for the Zaire beca because we understand that this magical object, this coin, has has ma has magical powers. That is, it's it's worked against a lot of different people, whereas Funus, we could say, well, it was, we're given a realistic explanation. It's right. because he fell and off a wall, as I, I recall. So, so think of those two for a minute, but look at, let's just look a little more closely at the Zaire. Do you want us to go to any passage that you underlined in particular, Ruth? Are you... Um, <coughs> I'm thinking of, nine, of 163, where this dysfunction begins to, to really rule this, his, his perceptions, his life. Um, look at that middle paragraph on 163. Time which generally attenuates memories, attenuates, right? Everybody got it? 
only aggravates that of the Zaire. There was a time when I could visualize the obverse and then the reverse, both sides of the coin, right? Now I see them simultaneously. This is not only, this is not as the, as though the Zaire were crystal because it is not a matter of one face being superimposed upon the other. Rather, it is as though my eyesight were spherical and the Zaire in the center. Whatever, it is, whatever is not the Zaire comes to me fragmentarily as if from a great distance. And then he lists some things, that famous list. Skip down a couple sentences. Perhaps he meant that there is, oh, this is Tennyson. Go, read this about Tennyson. Tennyson once said that if we could understand a single flower, we should know what we are and what the world is. That's an idealistic position. That's idealism. That platonic chair that Plato, the chair that is always cited for that ideal object, which is more real than the real, if you're an idealist, by the way. That idea is what's real. But it's, so Tennyson is making a, an idealistic statement here. If, if we have one one ideal instance, we can understand all of the specif specifics. This would appeal to this narrator because he has one ideal object, or not so ideal, it's the Zaire, one object to which everything else is tied. Perhaps he meant that there is no fact, however insignificant, that does not involve universal history and the infinite concatenation of cause and effect. If you want Borges in a nutshell, that's the sentence. Everything is involved with everything else and universal history, the history of everything is what is interesting. Perhaps, to, I take this as Borges' statement of his own view of the world. Perhaps, let's read it again. Perhaps he meant that there is no fact, however insignificant, that does not involve universal history and the, in the, the infinite concatenation, the infinite chain of cause and effect. It's the butterfly <coughs> effect that we've lately heard about from scientists. Isn't that, wasn't that chaos theory, where a butterfly flaps her little wings. Isn't that what it's called? Yeah chaos theory, where everything involves everything else. Yes, Kathy. Uh, I was just going to say, yeah, and he tries, um, in the story, he attempts to separate uh, Zaheer from, from everything else. Yeah. You know, it's connected to everything. And it doesn't work. I mean, it, it, it still consumes him. Yeah. And, and mm -hmm. I just, I think it goes back to what Ian was saying about the shred. I think, I think if you're reading this psychologically, you want him to continue to do something about it. Go seek therapy. Oh, absolutely. Do yes. Yeah, absolutely. No, can you imagine being around a person like this? It would be a terrible penance. It's good because what can he do really? What can any of us do? Yeah. We just have to accept it. He's accepting the faith. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we can talk about what Borges' Zaire is or what my Zaire is, for that matter, what any of ours is. Um, but for the moment, let's say that we're, we're, you thank you for your comment that you're 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 seeing also this incredible imbrication implication of everything with everything the labyrinth it's the labyrinth the view of the world is a labyrinth that is a absolutely inescapable that is there's no center and there's no circumference well that's pascal's sphere we'll have to go there perhaps he meant let's just go on and finish this paragraph perhaps he meant that the visible world is implicit in every phenomenon just as the will according to schopenhauer is implicit in every subject the Kabbalists, you see that this all this erudition these are philosophers Kab the K kabbalah as you may know is a form of Jewish mysticism, lots of metaphors, interpretive text, let's say, of biblical matters, but a whole tradition of mystical writings. The Kabbalists pretend that man is a microcosm, a symbolic mirror of the universe. According to Tennyson, everything, everything would be. Everything, even the intolerable Zaire. So, so in that, this, uh, this, these few sentences, we get a kind of philosophy that I think is Borges' sense of, of the world. At least we see it replicated in story after story. What happens the very end, just keep going. Well, it's, it's hard to summarize Borges, and he's short enough. Let's just read toward the end, to the end. Before 1948, Julia's destiny will have caught up with me. They will have to feed me and dress me. I shall not know whether it is afternoon or morning. Same tone. I shall not know who Borges was. I will have lost myself to this object, to this obsession. 
To call this pro prospect terrible is a fallacy, for none of its circumstances will exist for me. One might as well say that an anesthetized man feels terrible pain when they open his cranium. I shall no longer perceive the universe, I shall perceive the Zaire. According to the teaching of the idealist, the words live, live and dream, live, sorry, the words live and dream are rigorously synonymous. An idealist would think that an idea is as real or more real than reality, right? So an idealist, the dream, a dream is real. That's Borges. Borges is a proto-idealist writing very short fictions because if he wrote long ones, he'd have to become a materialist. Novels have lots and lots of things in them. He says, ah, that's why I write short stories. For, for thousands of images, I shall pass to one. From a highly complex dream to a dream of utter simplicity. Others will dream that I am mad. I shall dream of the Zaire. When all the men on earth think day and night of the Zaire, what will be a dream and which is reality, the earth or the Zaire? The empty hours, in the empty hours, empty night hours, I can still walk through the streets and so forth. Go down to the last couple of sentences. Perhaps I shall conclude by wearing away the Zaire simply through thinking of it again and again. Now there's that crossing of the real and the ideal, if ever you wear away the physical thing by thinking about it. Mm -hmm. Perhaps behind the coin I shall find God. So again, that elegant hope, remember that phrase at the end of the Library of Babel, here's another elegant hope. Um, perhaps behind the, the, this coin I shall find God, find meaning, find systems that are a system that signifies, right? And then Funus, I don't think we have to go into. That's one of the more readable ones, but Funus is just the opposite. Here we have this man at the end obsessed by a single object, which takes him into a world like Tlon, a world where there's only that ideal object. So this ideal object, an object of thought, in a, in a sense, which um, can nonetheless be touched and, and felt. So playing around with these categories. Anybody want to spend time on Funus and Memorius? I think what I'd like to do is have you count on you to reread that. It seems to me um, f capturable. Would you on Monday or Tuesday bring Labyrinth as well as is it Carpentier for next next week? Yeah, bring Carpentier, of course, from our Magical Realism Anthology. But um, nonetheless, we have a few more things to say about uh, labyrinths. So I will see you on Tuesday.